In a perfect world, there'd be a way to blend a writer's devotion to art with a way to earn a living. But as many full-time writers know, as soon as writing becomes a money-making endeavor, all kinds of strings get attached. Writers will get publisher's notes saying you've got to cut this or include that, or your book has to be so many pages and not one word more or less. Picture book writers often have no say in which illustrator is appointed, and illustrators will have their art micromanaged down to the skin color, hair color, clothing, and sex of every background character in a crowd scene. And yet, despite that, commercially produced books can often be amazing. They can be moving works of literature that make good money and speak to the human soul. Throughout this year, I've been featuring writers from Leicestershire, the gorgeous county in the Midlands of England where I live. During December, my featured writer is all of them. I'd like to suggest some books that they've written that you can give as gifts. I haven't received anything in exchange for these endorsements. And in the spirit of the season and of respecting the value of art beyond mere money, here's my list of books that would make great holiday gifts. For toddlers, try Christmas Street by Jonathan Emmett. The entire book folds out into a street scene and your little one can lift up flaps to discover what else is going on in the village. The book makes a great Christmas decoration if you have a long table or bookshelf to display it on. Or you could get some little toys out, and it makes a great backdrop for imaginative play with your kids. For younger school-age children, grab some of the books in the Diary of a Killer Cat series by Anne Fine. These books are addictive and side-splittingly hilarious. If you have a reluctant reader, I think the Killer Cat books can help by making reading fun. You can also get the books from the Raffle the Rail Dog series by Rachel Greaves for kids who have a sense of adventure, but also want to learn how to keep a level head in an emergency. If you have a tween reader with a taste for historical fiction, grab a copy of Mohinder's War by Bally Rye. This tells the tale of a downed RAF pilot who has to escape to safety in Nazi-occupied France during World War II. If your kiddo is into sports, grab literally anything written by Rob Childs. This author was a schoolteacher and sports coach who turned to writing, and his books don't just portray soccer games realistically, but they're surprisingly sensitive in how they address the emotions and concerns of kids approaching their teen years. My Diary by Emily Owen is an autobiography by a woman who has been through some astonishingly tough medical challenges. She makes an excellent role model for young people who will have their own difficulties in life and will have to learn to live with them. Emily's deep faith will appeal to Christian readers, but you don't have to be religious in order to respect and appreciate her resilience, pragmatism, and lyrical writing voice. The Midnight Panther by Punam Mystery would make an excellent selection for any kid who struggles with accepting themselves for who they are. This is a story about a panther who wishes he could be cool like the lion, the leopard, or the tiger. He even dresses himself in embarrassing costumes to try to imitate their looks. But in the end, he discovers that accepting himself for who he actually is, instead of cosmetically imitating someone else, is what will make him happy. And, of course, podcast co-host Chloe is also the co-author of Cindy Feller, An Old West Fairy Tale. This is a playful retelling of Cinderella set in the mythical Old West. You can read it to younger children, and middle grades and up will be able to read it independently. Teenagers will love the Neil Peel series by Ben Dixon. Ben is triply qualified to write about an angsty teenager trying to survive school, having once been a teenager himself, and now he has not only raised his own teenagers, but he also teaches them at school. Some books are true all-ages tales. Leicestershire Folk Tales for Children and Forest Folk Tales for Children by Tom Phillips are lyrical tellings of local legends that are honestly perfect for anyone who's interested in folklore and storytelling. If you're looking for something for adults, The later novels in the Adrian Mole series by Sue Townsend delve into the realities of being a grown-up, or attempting to be one anyway. Her stories are filled with bittersweet warmth and humor, and they make you feel a little bit better about yourself and your own imperfections. So now that I've started this episode with something that wasn't commercially motivated, I'm going to contrast that with something that is. 
the exploitation of books by companies seeking to create a profitable franchise. On Instagram, I recently had a conversation with Ruled Doll Eats a Donut. Please check out this profile because it consists of hilariously surreal AI-generated images of Ruled Doll. Ruled Doll Eats a Donut asked me if I would be watching or reviewing the new Wonka movie, which comes out in a few days. Uh, my answer is probably not, unless I make something very brief for the YouTube channel. This isn't because I'm upset about the movie, or because I think it's trash that desecrates Ruled Doll's legacy. I'm just busy, and this movie has nothing to do with children's literature. Unlike the film version of Matilda the Musical that came out last year, Wonka was not written by Ruled Doll at all. It doesn't come from his body of work, and although it's being officially produced by people who control his intellectual property, it's just something based on his characters. I can't even call it fan fiction, because the people who are making this movie aren't fans. They're here for the money, and they're going to squeeze that sweet, sweet intellectual property for all it's worth. That's well within their rights, but it's also within my rights to not be interested. This is a pattern that's repeated itself quite a lot recently, as great authors of the 20th century died off. Usually at first, there's a caretaker of the author's work who understood and respected their wishes. But then after that caretaker dies, people who are mainly interested in money take over. Often the writer's grandkids, who grew up rich and didn't have to work for it, sell the rights to a corporation that manages the writer's work as long as it's still covered by copyright. This was the case with Dr. Seuss's wife, Audrey. She collaborated with him quite a lot in his work, and he regularly asked her opinion on everything from color palettes to the social themes in books like The Lorax. Dr. Seuss died in 1991, but before that, the couple planned for Audrey to take over the work they'd done together. Audrey remained a wise and caring steward of her husband's work, finding an excellent balance between profitability and respect for the original art. A substantial portion of the profits from Dr. Seuss's work went to support numerous charities, both locally in San Diego and worldwide. And then she died in 2018, and the Dr. Seuss Foundation happily cashed in. Instead of carefully picking projects that adapt Dr. Seuss's work in a way that's true to and respectful of the original material, his writing has now just been taken over as intellectual property that can be used to create content. As in stuff that fills a void. The intellectual equivalent of a can of Pringles. The same thing has happened to J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien's work was meticulously guarded and curated by his son Christopher for decades after the author's death. Christopher Tolkien was often overprotective of his father's legacy, sometimes being a bit too rigid. For example, he was very displeased with the film adaptations of The Lord of the Rings directed by Peter Jackson. Yeah, changes were made, and yeah, a film version is going to naturally emphasize the action and adventure parts of the story, but there's a reason why these films are so beloved. But then maybe there was cause for Christopher Tolkien's concern, because when he died, the grandkids happily cashed in their grandfather's legacy in exchange for so much money that it probably had to be delivered by a fleet of dump trucks. And that's how we ended up with a show like The Rings of Power. I have nothing really to add to the numerous criticisms which have described this show as a soulless, surprisingly cheap-looking, horribly miscast, poorly written, disrespectful treatment of Tolkien's work. The only enjoyment I got out of The Rings of Power was a hilarious conversation with two friends, one Irish, one Scottish, who absolutely ripped the show to shreds for its boneheaded use of racist tropes against their respective peoples. But the show didn't make me angry. It didn't ruin Tolkien's writing for me. I can ignore a garbage product like The Rings of Power because it has nothing to do with Tolkien or his writing. It's just content. This brings me to the Wonka film. I'm mostly puzzled that this thing got greenlit at all. I think enough films have bombed lately that studios should have figured out by now that not every story needs a prequel. For example, The Hunger Games prequel came out recently, and while it did okay, it didn't exactly generate the kind of cash needed to revive a franchise. Coriolana Snow is an amazing villain in the Hunger Games series. Everything I need to know about him is already there in the original trilogy of books. And he's more interesting when his background is mysterious. I don't learn anything new or necessary by reading about 
or watching a film about his angsty teen years. It would be like watching a movie about Darth Vader when he was a bratty little kid. Oh. Oh. Anyway, I don't need a Wonka prequel. It's not even a prequel to the actual book. It's a prequel to the film based on the book. And I really liked that movie when I was a kid. It was weird and a bit scary and the music rocked. But you know who didn't like it? Ruled Dahl. Even though he'd been involved in the film production every step of the way, he didn't like what happened to his work once it was out of his hands. So I feel pretty comfortable saying he wouldn't have approved the production of a film that featured his characters saying words he didn't even write. I also don't know what this movie is going to have to say about Willy Wonka that we don't already know. He's an oddball recluse who is super into making candy and doesn't care very much about industrial safety standards. That's all. He also wasn't the main character of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie Bucket was the main character, because Ruled Dahl wrote books for children and about children. So I'm just not terribly interested in the Wonka film, because it has nothing to do with my interest in children's writers and children's literature. It's just content. I don't have a basic problem with adaptations. It's part of the life cycle of art. Artists put their work out into the world, and when it's accepted by enough of us, it takes on its own life, growing, changing, and even being referenced and elaborated upon. But corporate interests can only cut up and recycle a writer's work so many times before it just ends up as bland, distorted, artless sludge. Content. And if you enjoy some of this content, that's fine. Earlier I compared it to a can of Pringles. Sometimes some Pringles are pretty tasty but you shouldn't make them a regular part of your diet. I'm not going to tell you what to watch or what to pay for. That's your business. I just want to encourage you to recognize content for what it is. There's only one place where I'm going to draw a hard line, and that's over Grinchmas. The corporate powers that control Dr. Seuss have been pushing this harder every year with lots and lots of Grinch-branded merchandise. Some of it is admittedly really cute. There are slippers that look like the Grinch's feet, pajamas, socks with grumpy quotes on them, mugs that look like the Grinch's head. There's a huge social media campaign with a comedian in a Grinch suit attempting to say meme-worthy stuff. I can see why a lot of people would think all this merch was fun, because they love the book and the old TV specials, and some kids who don't know better actually like those terrible movies that recently came out. Except, like... Remember what the book was about? Like, the actual message of how the Grinch stole Christmas? Remember how it was about the fact that stuff is not the reason for the season? I cannot think of a more profoundly ironic thing than the commercialization of how the Grinch stole Christmas. I've checked the tags on the Grinch merch at my local superstore, and based on the prices and manufacturing locations, these items were almost certainly made in sweatshops. They contribute to the problem our culture has with disposable goods and fast fashion, all while relying on people, often children, working for slave wages. I sincerely believe that Dr. Seuss would have been deeply offended by all this, so it's the one area of content where I'm going to make a stand and say I really don't think you should support it. To paraphrase Dr. Seuss, I must stop this Grinchmas from coming. I'll vote with my wallet, and I hope you do the same. Every year, the meaning of Christmas is hopelessly pummeled by the spirit of commercialism, but I've done what I can. I've recommended some books that I genuinely think you and your kids will enjoy. And hopefully you've stuck with me as I got some thoughts out of my brain that have been building up for some time. You don't have to tolerate whatever products are thrown at you, no matter how much corporations claim it's entertainment. You can choose what you will and won't accept. And you can find that balance between art and commercial concerns. Regardless, the original writing of the authors you admire will always be there for you, untarnished as it stands above the cheap copies made by corporations. 